comment a little bit about her background. She has research interests in food safety and in nutrition, um, and uh, she's uh, been working in that area for a very long time, um, very successfully as she was uh, elected to the um, Institute of Medicine at the National Academy of Sciences. And so she's very much at home in this building, and so it's very appropriate for her to welcome us today. So I'd be happy to uh, welcome you to the podium, Dr. Wotek. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Chris has told you, um, my job this afternoon is to welcome you. Uh, so welcome. Uh, welcome to the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, welcome to Washington, D.C., and welcome to this very important workshop on uh, functional annotation of animal genomes. I know there are a lot of people who've been spending a lot of time in planning uh, for this day uh, and who also have a lot of plans about what's going to happen in the weeks and months to, to come. Uh, so they've been eagerly anticipating this meeting. And we at uh, the Department of Agriculture have been very pleased to be part of those planning activities and also um, very happy to provide some sponsorship for, uh, for this workshop. So welcome. Uh, I'm told that there's representation in this group from 24 different US states and from 13 different countries, uh, which is really a, a remarkably diverse group to assemble. Uh, but I think it's also very much demonstrative of how international agricultural science has become. So uh, it's great to see that. Um, as all of you are aware, uh, we are facing a real existential challenge for humanity. And that is over the next generation, uh, how are we going to intensify agricultural production in such a way that we'll be able to provide for the growing numbers of humans on this planet, not only enough food, uh, but fiber, uh, 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 fuel, uh, and do it in a way that is going to be sustainable into all of the future generations to come. Uh, it is a massive challenge, and it's one that people in the world are becoming aware of. Uh, there is more discussion that is going on in public venues as well as in policy venues. Uh, but the work um, that this group is undertaking uh, does have the promise uh, to provide insights uh, that will help us in meeting that dramatic challenge. Um, at USDA, we believe that it's also very important to have a diverse group of scientists participating in research. We believe that that diversity brings different viewpoints, different perspectives, the ability to have different insights into data sets. Um, so it's great to see the diversity in this group of scientists who are assembled around this very important topic. We also believe that that diversity of approaches um, and insights is also going to help us to develop workable solutions uh, to this problem of a a sustainable intensification of agricultural production. Uh, solutions in animal genomics are going to be a very important part of that, uh, that uh, uh, set of solutions for the global food sustainability uh, challenge. And the efforts by the animal genomics community um, seeking to expand the functional annotation in other animal genomes and also in using comparative biology approaches is going to enable knowledge transfer beyond the agricultural interests uh, into human and other dimensions. So success is going to be in creating a deeper knowledge of functional uh -huh. genomics and enhancing our ability to genetically improve domesticated species uh, consumed as food from our perspective. 
Um, doing that by strengthening model species for biomedical research, strengthening our understanding of basic biological principles governing genotype to phenotype prediction are also going to be great outcomes and contribute to the body of knowledge. I have, uh, as many of you know, been very much interested and been advocating for the last five years for establishing a set of what I've called platforms to enable research in the agricultural sciences. And your community, uh, the geneticists, the people who are working in the, the omics areas, genomics, metabolomics, have really been leaders in establishing those collaborative platforms, providing open access to your data sets and analytical tools, um, providing also for open access to publications, uh, and also advocating for open access to the genome, the germplasm collections that countries around the world are maintaining. Those are three of the key aspects to open science that I think are going to be enormously important. And uh, since we have so many countries um, represented here, and many of you are coming from members of the G20 countries, I've been very pleased that the G20 has, for the last four years, been convening a meeting of agricultural chief scientists who have agreed to adopt these platforms and to move them forward within their countries. So I really um, am looking forward to hearing what the outcomes are gonna be from your workshop. I hope you have an opportunity to enjoy our beautiful city of Washington, DC. And since you're right here on the mall, I wanted to give you one little piece of history that you may not know. Um, if you walk out of this building, and look to the left, you'll see the Washington Monument. And uh, during the Civil War, the construction on the Washington Monument was stopped. Uh, and there are a beautiful set of photographs that were taken from that truncated Washington Monument looking towards the US Capitol. And they show a row of greenhouses, they show cultivated fields going from the Washington Monument to the US Capitol. That were our first agricultural demonstration plots for the US Department of Agriculture in the 1860s. So there, is, there are deep agricultural roots here in the middle of the city. And I hope that when you go out and walk around, you'll have that memory uh, looking at it and also seeing the possibility that there were crops growing there. 150 years ago. So welcome and much success to you in this workshop. Thanks very much for, I think this takes us. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Wateki. Those very interesting uh, opening remarks and some nice history there. I, I uh, ran along the, uh, the mall this morning and didn't realize that there were fields there uh, near the Washington Monument. Oh, really? Uh, great. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is, is give you a little bit of background. I've got a few announcements first, um, though, uh, and, and then, then I'll welcome our, our plenary speaker for the evening. The first thing I really need to do is thank the financial support um, of, of the National Science Foundation, the USDA, and a couple of different roles, both the NRSP8 coordinators supported uh, this, this conference, as well as, as NIFA provided a, a grant um, uh, uh, similar to the one that the National Science Foundation did. Uh, I have some, um, uh, some support as well from my department and my college, uh, and Illumina has also provided um, support as well for this conference. Uh, just so you understand this in a, in a more uh, important context, they reduced your registration fees 90%. So, so uh, let's give a thank, uh, a round of applause to the people that just reduced your money. I also wanted to thank the support staff who've been uh, really excellent today and, and in the past. 
but also the, the organizing committee. There's a lot of help, um, as you can tell, uh, getting, getting things set up and, and uh, getting things uh, well underway. So I'd also like to thank uh, the support staff and the organizing committee. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, if you need them, rest, even if you don't need them, they're still there. The restrooms are down the stairs and around to the left and sort of in the hallway that some of you may have come in if you came on the, on the, uh, the C Street side. Um, I'd like to also, uh, this is something that's not in your program. Tomorrow, right after uh, the, the uh, funding agencies um, give their perspectives, I'd like to see if we get to get a picture. And I think the best picture for the group um, is the stairs outside the Constitution Avenue entrance. So if once we're done, I'll remind you, of course, again tomorrow, but once we're done, uh, right before lunch, um, keep you from lunch just for a couple of minutes and take a picture. So um, let me go ahead and start with my charge to attendees. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, is give you a little bit of uh, background uh, and, and then also what we'd like to accomplish at this conference. And so that's, that's really the outline, pretty short one, a brief history and the purpose of FANG, um, and then uh, exactly what we're going to do in this workshop. So just the brief history, a couple of slides on that. Um, we had our first workshop that was organized uh, at PEG in 2014 in January, uh, and we had discussions throughout that year. That resulted in a manuscript um, and was uh, uh, published in, in 2015 in Genome Biology. We um, also had a second meeting during that process uh, at PEG, um, uh, and, and of course the white paper was published. So really the the group has only been around for about a year and a half, and, and we've got really quite a bit accomplished in, in that time. Um, one of the other things that, that is really clear in that year and a half is the organic growth of the project. It's really has, has, has developed from the ground up, from the scientists up. The, the paper authors are shown on the left. Just to give you a little bit of an idea, the current membership is over 240 people um, covering six continents, uh, and we really have a lot of people involved with this. So a little bit of what, what are we actually talking about? What are we all talking about? Um, I, I'd phrase it in terms of a hypothesis. We're all scientists. So what's the hypothesis here? At least for me, um, it's understanding that animal genomes is a powerful means uh, to learn about biology and to solve societal problems. And as my bioinformaticist friends would say, uh, we need to move biology from stamp collecting to physics. In other words, move it from looking at things and putting, putting them on a shelf to actually trying to make a fundamental laws about them. And so another way of saying that is we're, we want to go from descriptive to predictive biology. The value of, of predictive biology, or might, we might also call it genome to phenome, um, is, is threefold. I think we want to understand biological mechanisms. We want to improve phenotypes or traits that are important um, in generating food and fiber. Uh, very similar to what Dr. Wotecki said. Um, and we also want to improve models for, for human medicine. We propose that we can contribute to all of these if we uh, improve our functional annotation of our genomes. So specifically, what does the, our group or, or domesticated animal genomics have for prediction biology or predictive biology? I think there's two major strengths of our group. First is that we have a, a history um, of, and a huge phenotypic data sets on quantitative traits, including domestication and, and in selection. Further, than, further, we have a very long history in applying quantitative approaches to biology. We're, we're uh, one of the original bioinformaticists. We've, we've been doing, uh, working with enormous data sets for 50 or 60 years. Second, we have an opportunity all of our animal genomes are now available, so we can move forward, and we're really ready for the next stage in, an, in understanding biology. I just want to give a couple of slides that maybe brings a specific, uh, a little bit more specifics to that. Um, first, talk about genotypes, um, but there's already big data in domesticated animal research. This is um, data from one genotyping company in the United States. It doesn't reflect worldwide. Just give you a little bit of an idea of the size of the data. There's over a million SNP chips already been processed for a number of different uh, species relevant to domesticated animals. Beyond just SNP typing, uh, we are already starting to work with re, uh, uh, resequence data 
Uh, a lot of genome resequencing has already started. Uh, this is just some data that um, I've asked some of the leaders in the field just over the last week, what, where are we at? And we're, we're looking at over 4,000 individuals that have already been resequenced. And I want to make the point that this gives us enormous power, huge power, um, because um, if you sequence founders uh, of, of pedigreed populations, that allows, to, allows us to impute most, if not all, um, of the variants um, using SNP data from, from those populations. So you can do the SNP work on most of the animals, sequence the, the founders, and, and really be able to, to harvest an enormous amount of information relative to those, to those, um, to those animals. On the phenotype side, uh, that's again a very large strength of our group. Um, uh, Jim Risi runs Animal QTLDB, and people pour data into that. Um, really, just to summarize, uh, or just for the six species that we uh, we uh, collate data on, there's over 1,500 populations uh, publications. Sorry, uh, over 1,700 different phenotypes have been um, identified uh, and cataloged with with over 50,000 different QTL localized. So we have enormous amount of, of uh, phenotypic data uh, in the database. I want to give again a little bit more specifics to this. Uh, just give you four examples of big data uh, in, in domesticated animal research. Uh, the poor porcine uh, reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus analysis that people are working on. A number of groups are working on feed efficiency. There's a group, work, a large group um, working on bovine respiratory disease. Uh, and there's also new ideas about sequence-based genomic selection. And, and just uh, because I'm involved with the PERS project, I thought I would give you just a couple of, of, of bullet points on that. Um, there's over, uh, in this project, uh, which has really been um, uh, 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 driven by industry, they, they asked academia to, to get started on this. They funded the initial research and they organized the first meetings. So this is really a, a collaboration between academia and industry. Um, these are all the industry animals. They provided those animals for free. Over 3,600 uh, animals have been challenged and, and genotyped. Over 30,000 samples have been uh, cataloged and, and um, also processed. So we have viral load and many other traits. In terms of what we've accomplished, we've got one genetic locus, locus that has been identified controlling tolerance, a, a relative level of tolerance to the virus, and we've begun to look at transcriptional response networks. But we really have a long way to go, and when there's an enormous amount of data to analyze and, and mine there. So really what we're looking at is that what's the next level? And, and I would argue that we need to move to that, which is functional analysis to really identify predictors, tolerance, and resistance. So I'll move on to what we're trying to accomplish here. What are we trying to accomplish today and tomorrow? And I think we can be summarized in these three points. We want to further or foster further collaboration in, in um, Bang research, broadly stated. We want to document the progress in that, but also the scientific needs that we have in, in the, our understanding of animal genomes. And then finally, we want to lay a foundation for an expansion of, of opportunities uh, for Fang research. So I'll give you a little bit of a, uh, an idea of the plan that we have just briefly. Tonight we're setting the stage um, and, and Dr. Stan will give a plenary talk on, on really how it's done. Someone that's, that's already been there and done that. Uh, tomorrow uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, uh, really where we are and, and, and what's, uh, what are other specific um, aspects of this progress. So we're, or process, we we're, we're, have two plenary talks on data use and, and data analysis. And we also have talks by FANG organizers as to our progress uh, in, in those areas. And then I think a really interesting and important aspect is we asked several funding agencies to come and give uh, a short uh, uh, bit of their perspective uh, on, on animal genomics and functional annotation. In the afternoon, we have two breakout sessions, which are, are a really a, a very important aspect, a heart of this conference is really to, to have small groups um, to discuss um, to get feedback uh, and on, on some of the plans that will be stated and then identify future steps. What are we going to do in, um, in, in after, after tomorrow? And finally, we'll come back together. We'll report uh, to the entire group that the small groups talked about. Uh, and then we want to have a summary and discussion for plans for the future. How will we measure success of this project um, or this, this meeting at least? Um, 
I think we, we we're already on track to publish uh, the workshop outcomes. Uh, we also want to have plans for improving both collaborative research and also infrastructure for FANG. Um, and I think an important aspect is the continued dialogue. So we already have meetings planned for the next two years, one, two meetings each year for the next two years. So we'll, we'll, we'll continue to have dialogue. It's not gonna end tomorrow. Um, but I think the most important um, measure of success will really be an expansion of FANG research and its impacts um, for um, basic science uh, research into improving traits and, and, and really looking at models for biomedicine. So I would just say uh, to finish here, uh, what's your, what, what, what is my charge to you? So your charge uh, for the next day and a half is really active participation. So active participation today and tomorrow, challenge the speakers, um, join in the conversation at the breakout sessions, especially, uh, but also provide suggestions for moving forward, not only during the next day or two, but, but certainly please follow up um, and let us know um, what you thought of the conference and what we should do. And again, that's what I would say, the active participation in the future is really important. That's it. Um, I, I think what I'd like to do is, is not take any questions. And uh, I, maybe I got a couple of minutes. I could take questions if there are any, and then I'll, um, I'll be able to introduce our plenary speaker. So. What's that? Challenge everybody but you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can challenge me, Alan. Go ahead. Yeah, OK. And we do have a couple of minutes while, while um, John sets up. Any, any questions? They're afraid to challenge me now. I said they, not they, not, not you. Thanks, and, and thanks so much for having me here. Um, okay, so um, I am, uh, I work, just by full disclosure here, I work chiefly on the human, uh, and, um, uh, and also we've done some work in uh, model organisms uh, in the mouse, which I'll touch on a little bit in my talk, and, uh, and various other sort of uh, staple model organisms. Um, but I think everything I'm going to talk about today is directly applicable to uh, decoding animal genomes and applying the same types of principles and the same uh, lessons that we've learned from the human genome. I think it directly uh, can be ported over to uh, animal genomes. And of course, you now have the perspective of hindsight in terms of uh, not only how it can get done, how it can get organized. Uh, and I'm going to pick on Elise since she's here. If people don't know, uh, Elise Feingold is the program officer of the ENCODE project and really has been instrumental uh, in actually orchestrating and organizing how a project like this gets done over a, over a long period of time. Maybe she can probably find her. Elise, hold your hand up. I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to actually give you, I, I think, an overview perspective of um, kind of the intellectual basis for trying to uh, approach and decode a genome using, a, 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 in this case, I'll, I'll sort of focus on a particular a technology, but in, in reality, what I'm going to say is, is true for everything. Um, and, and really kind of 
home in, I think, on what are the key uh, big picture messages. So, you know, in general, I think when you approach um, uh, a genome, you, you know, people think about this is a decoding problem in the same sense that, that you know, reading this is a decoding problem. That if only you can come along and, and somehow that there's information there and it's read left to right. And, you know, before this Disney movie came out, you used to you could Google Book of Life, and this is the first thing that came up was this uh, uh, thing here. But now it's a bunch of characters. Um, but, you know, and, and what this does is this leads you to believe that, you know, that the problem is really that we're just kind of missing the code, okay? That what we really need are one of these secret rings that's gonna like this help us to actually read this, this sort of linear genome. Um, and I think the general theme of what, what I'm uh, gonna tell you, uh, you know, is, is if you're really looking for one of these, um, this is not the right place. Okay? Because there is not any universal set that's gonna come in there and tell you exactly how, uh, how to read things. Um, and so I'm gonna start out with the basic, uh, question of what is a complex genome. When we think of a genome, we think of DNA. But the problem with DNA is it never exists by itself in a complex genome, right? It's always uh, complex with, uh, with chromatin. And the DNA itself is basically chemically active, but it's essentially biologically inert until it adopts some kind of, uh, some kind of form. And, and, and that form is what you know, I can cartoon as a living genome. Um, of course, you, you dive into any animal genome, and you're, you're going to find one of these. Uh, you've got DNA, here's the blue, it's wound around uh, uh, nucleosomes. They're packaged up into some higher structure uh, in, in the nucleus, uh, embedded in all of this stuff, genes, genes making RNA. Um, and then there are these regions that are going to be uh, a key focus of my talk, which I'm just generically going to call the regulatory DNA, and I'll explain why that's generic uh, in a little bit. Um, these are short stretches of genome in which uh, sequence-specific DNA binding proteins, a, a relatively few of them are complex in place of a canonical nucleosome, and this triggers all kinds of downstream events. These, these little guys then can recruit enzymes that can put modifications on neighboring uh, histones. Um, they uh, can have some interaction with the DNA methylation machinery uh, so that these regions are largely unmethylated, uh, almost exclusively really when they're, when they're active. Um, and, and of course they control uh, this, or this process of, um, uh, of transcription. So I'm going to sort of um, divide my talk into three parts. Um, the first part I will call parts, and it's, it's about the part list. And really, these are the kinds of questions that we're that we're asking. And imagine that that you guys uh, will, will all be asking: Where are all uh, the regulatory regions? Um, because this is something you know you need to have in hand uh, uh, to solve a complex genome. Uh, what are all the transcription factors that occupy them and activate them? Um, on not only on a global level of like what's the deck of cards that the genome's playing with it, but also what are the individual hands that are dealt in, in specific spots. Um, how are these regions networked together in the sense that um, they are a control mechanism, they uh, influence, for example, the expression of one transcription vector gene, which then can influence other things, et cetera. So there's, it's all a working system. Um, and also kind of just, on a, a just, just to throw out the more general question, how densely is information actually encoded in the genome? Um, and, and this is where we start to break away from this idea of just sort of the linear uh, track. Um, and so there's, there's kind of, this is at the, I will call this kind of the genome layer here of like where all the, all the stuff is. Uh, and then stepping back, there's the issue of the patterns that you see. So one of the, one of the key um, lessons for me anyway over the last uh, four or five years is that there are unexpected emergent kind of properties in the system um, that, that you can only see once you get a lot of data. And if you have a lot of data, you can start crossing it with other kinds of data sets and, and all sorts of interesting things uh, emerge. And um, so I'm just going to touch on a, a couple of patterns. Um, one is the relation to disease-associated variation uh, that shakes out when you get lots of data uh, uh, about um, uh, regulatory genomes and cross them with uh, lots of genotype data. Um, also, evidence of things that genomes are doing that we uh, only you know, may have speculated about, but the idea is that there are larger scale patterns that appear to encode um, uh, cellular memory and maturity. Uh, and also, uh, we can also look at the impact of things on, uh, on mutation of uh, genome structure and mutational pattern. Um, and lastly, I'll just touch briefly on this issue of, of kind of origin, where did the, you know, the regulatory genome or how did it evolve 
uh, because it has some implications for how uh, you approach individual species and what you, know, you can expect to be uh, the sweet spot for the use of comparative genomics versus species-specific um, uh, empirical approaches. Okay, so the first part I want to talk about uh, are the parts. And here I want to actually dial the clock way back and, and just take a, kind of a, a brief recap of um, sort of a simplified view of, uh, of the history of, of where we are and how, how we got here. And, and this, you have to go back to the 19, um, uh, really to the 1970s. Um, and so the, the, the seminal recognition in the mid 1970s that uh, there was a relationship between the structure of chromatin, the structure of DNA in the nucleus, and, and gene activation, uh, the work of uh, Harold Weintraub and, and Mark Ledeen and, and others. And, and by, uh, uh, you know, in the late 70s, we had this burst of fundamental technology that showed up with carbon blotting, there was, uh, you know, technology for RNA detection. Uh, there was uh, DNA footprinting, and the, or there was the, sorry, so there was sequencing, and then there was DNA footprinting, and so suddenly there was this toolbox that people had in around the 1980s to apply to uh, all kinds of interesting um, problems. And as things started, the resolution started to increase a little bit. There was the discovery and sort of important recognition that there was more going on in the genome than was just uh, at the promoter. Which was sort of the Jacob and Minot uh, style view, um, and 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 concomitant with this was the discovery that the regulatory information in uh, a, a section of genome is is essentially encompassed in a special kind of physical structure that could be detected with a molecular biological reagent uh, in in the in the primary case nucleases. And so once these, these sort of things were put two and two together, there ensued a period, uh, really, which I'll, 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 I'll say goes for about two decades, where there was systematic mapping and functional characterization of regulatory DNA, kind of the old fashioned way, uh, lots of southern blots, binding things, testing them very uh, rigorously, and, and such that right around the time that the human genome sequence uh, happened, we have gone back and collated everything uh, and, and, and it turns out that you can reasonably confidently say that there were about 300 human regulatory elements that were mapped at that point in time. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, you know, with the genome sequence, there, there was triggered not, not only the availability of the sequence, but I think the basic idea that you could now couple technology with the biology of this period and then move forward. And this really triggered, so having the genome sequences as a scaffold then tr and, 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 and this technological sort of realization triggered a wave of, of successive technologies and development. I'm just listing a, you know, a couple of things from, from, from our lab, but, but this is really the, the, the general thing that happened over this decade is that, is that there was a continuous cycle of development and uh, application of uh, of approaches aiming for bigger and bigger scale, faster, cheaper, better acquisition of the data. And tech one technology supplanted another from, you know, arrays, the sequencing, uh, et cetera. Um, and, uh, in, and in the case of the uh, sort of the nucleases um, and, and mapping that I mentioned, I can just take you briefly through uh, what, what the principle is and where it sort of ended up before we continue on in the, in the timeline. Um, and so in this, in this case, I mentioned that, uh, you know, that this, this genome feature is, um, uh, is, is distinguished by a specific uh, or altered chromatin structure so that when you throw a nuclease in uh, like DNase one, it very selectively cleaves the genome at this position. What I mean selectively, I mean that the cleavage of this DNA here is hundreds fold typically uh, uh, more frequent than even on the adjacent nucleosomes. And so what this does is it releases little fragments. You can catch these little fragments. Uh, you can sequence them. You can map them back um, uh, to a genome. So you do this, you sequence, you know, 20, 30 million of these, uh, uh, which used to be like a whole aluminum flow cell, but now it just, you know, blows by in some little uh, fraction of a lane. Um, and, uh, you know, you can do this on any, any given cell type, uh, some region of the, the genome, and you can just map all the reads and you see, uh, you see these little pileups of, of things sprout up. And, um, and these are, in this particular case, uh, uh, the marking the DNA hypersensitive sites, uh, which were sort of the staple of the, uh, uh, of the first few decades of, uh, 
of regulatory mapping in terms of finding where, where things were in the genome. Uh, and of course, you know, where these are, I'm just generically referring to it as, uh, as the regulatory DNA, um, since this feature seems to mark all, all of the various classes. Um, if, we, if we zoom into the tips of these things and we had a special microscope, we, you know, we would see there, there, there where the proteins are bound. And also then if we sequence very, very deeply and then moved from a view like this where we're just looking at the density of tags down, down to one where we're looking at individual you know, reads going to say 25 million reads down to hundreds of millions of reads, you can see uh, the emergence of a high resolution feature with factor footprints uh, where the proteins are sitting on the genome. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I will put the microphone closer, and I will try to speak louder too. Um, okay, so uh, if you now you know take this and you can apply it across uh, uh, many cell types, and you can kind of systematically then you know by comparison the genome annotations and other features to find promoters, enhancers, etc. So kind of a key number to to keep in mind, and this is something we have seen now in uh, in in several different vertebrate genomes. Uh, for, for higher animals is that there are uh, somewhere on the order of 100,000 to 250,000 elements per cell type. The number I try to keep, usually keep in my head is the average about 150,000 uh, of these sites that are on in a given cell type. That's you went around the genome and you counted up all the sort of the tips here. Um, and that equates to roughly 1% of the genome given that these things are, you know, 150, 200 base pairs in size. Okay, so those are sort of good numbers to keep in, uh, uh, in, in your head. Um, and so, and, and as you can see, there's just a few cell types here, but you know, kind of the next phase of, of having all these technologies is that there's the scaling uh, of, in this case, the NH1, but the, the parallel path for all the various other approaches uh, to, to hundreds of cell types. So first there was a scaling across the genome, now there's a scaling across uh, all these different cell types. And, and this is something that was, um, uh, enabled by, uh, uh, you know, by, by the ENCODE project and the, and the Roadmap Epigenomics project. And, and really what it amounts to is a systematic, developing a systematic anatomical sampling of, uh, of, of the human body in its, uh, uh, in, its, in its adult state, in its developing state, uh, of, and also particular widely used cell models, differentiating, differentiating ES cells, et cetera. And the result is now that you can basically go to public genome browsers um, for, for, for the human. You can flop your, your magnifying glass on any region of the genome you want. You can open up any number of different cell types you want. And there, is, and there are hundreds uh, that are available, um, uh, virtually, again, virtually all from primary cells and tissues, although now there's a, a growing amount that'll, that'll come in from cancer uh, and other kind of diseased cell types. And I'll comment on those in a little bit. But the basic idea then is you can sort of pull this up, pick your region, and you can watch the regulatory DNA turning on. You can basically watch on and off or watch the genome in action. So, you know, even regions like that light up like crazy in one cell type, they're just completely blank uh, in, in, in another cell type. Um, and so if you now put this information all together and you integrate, so here I'm going to, I'm going to integrate uh, some information from, uh, from the ENCODE project and, uh, and some other things and sort of Put together some some basic numbers here of where we kind of stand uh, in terms of the living genome. So in this compartment up here in the genes, um, this is a number that uh, uh, you know that you know back with the human genome and afterwards everybody was chasing the number of genes, how many genes, how many genes. Well, the number I actually like to keep in my head um, is not the is not the popular number. I like to keep a number of around fifty five thousand, and and that number actually breaks down in the following way. Uh, it breaks down to the, around the 21,000 sort of traditional protein coding genes that everybody's chasing, and we sort of coalesced around, you know, 20,680 20, or whatever protein coding genes. Um, and then there is uh, this other group of uh, what have been termed long non-coding RNA genes. And these are the things you look at them at the gene on the genome, and they look like genes. They have promoters, they have exons, they have like the structure and regulation that we expect of a gene. They just, at first glance, don't code for protein products. Um, and, and, but this is actually a potential lesson for, uh, for, 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 the, for this group, is you have to beware of genome annotations. So it turns out that, uh, that I think, a, a, now I have seen this in so many places and it's starting to come out in the literature, but it turns out that a lot of these non-coding RNA genes actually encode little tiny peptides uh, in them. And, um, and it turns out that when you go to the genome browser and you flip on the track that says, show me all the open reading groups, 
Well, it turns out that that is thresholded for a false discovery rate that somebody made up a long time ago. So it doesn't show you the little tiny ones that are there. And so a lot of these things, it turns out, if you turn on, you know, there's some ways to pull up these old tracks, you can see the genome littered with, with little tiny open reading frames. And so, you know, uh, and, and a lot of them are, are actually sitting in these genes and some of them are, you know, neuropeptide function, all kinds of weird stuff. Um, and then there's also other stuff going on that we don't really understand that there are these uh, smaller non-coding RNAs. They're, they're, you know, these, this is the location in the genome. We see a defined transcriptional activity. It doesn't fit with what we know as a gene. It's highly cell type specific. It has all these sort of interesting biological properties, but we don't quite know what to do uh, with it yet. So I kind of use this number for the genes. And within those genes, of course, there's, they have a promoter and they have alternative promoters as well. So there's, so there's not just sort of, you know, 55,000, uh, let's say, promoters sitting out there. In this compartment though, so what's controlling this? So in this compartment, uh, our, our, our currently we can define over 4 million regions uh, like this in, in the human genome. And of course, that doesn't mean that they show up, as I mentioned to you, only around 150,000 of these are showing up in any given cell type at any given time. Um, so what you really have is a tremendous vocabulary out there that's sort of being uh, selectively utilized uh, to, to, to speak out different cell programs. And, and as far as d diving inside and how many of these guys there are, um, uh, our, our, our current estimate is that there are over 20 million recognition elements in, um, uh, encoded in the human genome. So just to kind of recap this a little bit. So it said, you know, that the, the genome encodes at least uh, 4 million of these, these hypersensitive sites. Virtually all of these show some degree of lineage and cell type specificity. And I mean, the majority of them show a lot of it. There's another group of them that, that, that vary uh, uh, quite a bit. There's a vanishingly small number that you can detect in, in every cell type. And even those have amplitude variation uh, be between different cell types. Um, uh, and, and virtually all of this uh, action is out in non, the distal non-promoter space. And if you, you kind of do the math, you think, well, there, actually there are a lot of promoters born in the 55,000. Yeah, there's probably a couple hundred thousand uh, uh, promoters out there. And most of these promoter elements are actually appear to be <coughs> tissue or cell type selective alternative promoters um, that are giving rise to, you know, alternate RNA products, et cetera. And, and we're not, I don't think anywhere uh, close to completely cataloging uh, all of the all of that uh, richness that's that's out there. Um, another key thing is when you look at the genome, you're asking, okay, we've got these things out there. Uh, what are they doing, and who are they talking to? Well, the who are they talking to is something that we can um, we can take some approaches to kind of make make some uh, tentative conclusions. And I think at this point in time, we can tentatively connect about 20, 25 percent of the elements with one or more target gene. Uh, within about a megabase window. Um, and, and, and the way that that's sort of, uh, uh, you know, so if you kind of look at this, uh, it, look at this map and, you know, you see these elements out of your, and you see these genes, you're like, okay, which one is, which gene or whatever is this thing talking to? Or is it talking to some other gene um, far away? And, and, you know, just in general, what we know about long distance gene regulation is that this is the picture we expect, which is that we've got a gene it's gonna have some, that there are some sites that are really close to sort of to the promoter and everything, that those sites very likely are actually controlling that gene. But most of the genome is working like this. Sites controlling this gene, this guy's controlling some other gene, et cetera. So there's kind of interleaved pattern across the genome. And this is something that, this is not a new thing in genomics. I mean, this, this emerged out of the, you know, kind of 1980s to, to, to 2000 period. And, and, and this has only been enriched and expanded. By, uh, by genomic approaches. Um, but, and, and, but what we can do though, is we can also now follow what happens. So if you watch an element, let's say, as you go across cell types, and you can then ask, well, gee, if, is this element turned on at the same time as which gene promoter or which genes transcript, you know, within, let's say, a megabase window? And if you have 10 or 12 cell types, ah, you get some, some correlations. Once you get 100 cell types, you start to get real power to define elements and genes that are being very tightly co-regulated. And it turns out when you find those, they have all kinds of interesting properties. They have kind of the same transcription factors. They have all kinds of other things uh, that are there. And there's some sort of general principles out of this that you can uh, 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 put together, um, which is that the genome looks quite different from how it's put together depending on where you're standing. So if you're standing on the promoter um, and looking out, the average promoter uh, we would expect 
is linked to an order of 20 distal elements. That doesn't mean that it's out there in 20 in every cell type. It means you may use this one in this cell type and these ones in another cell type, uh, et cetera. Um, and again, this is sort of an inference across 100 cell types. Uh, but if you're standing out in the distal element land, um, it, you're, the, the, the world is much more selective. That half of the distal elements in this picture seem to blink on and off only in coordination with one gene. Um, and then there are other ones that are sort of linked to clusters of genes and, and things like that. But, but it's a very different picture depending on, on where you're standing. Um, and, and, and one of the cardinal features, I think it's, for me, it's kind of the cardinal feature of the regulatory genome is this tremendous selectivity of cell type and state, uh, uh, differentiation stage, et cetera. So that here we are having mapped hundreds and hundreds of things and tissues and whatever, we're still in the situation, even with lots and lots of super closely related cell types too, we're still in the situation where every cell type we can pull out has hundreds to thousands of elements that are completely unique to that cell type. So it, it is, and, and this, is, this is something that, again, it does not, done a bunch of calculations, is not gonna be cured, but you know, the, at the end game after we get it all done is that there's gonna be a tremendous amount of cell, uh, of cell type selectivity. Um, that, that's encoded. So I also mentioned that there are uh, all of these inside the, you know, these, these, these larger elements, what makes it work are all these uh, regulatory factor, transcription factor recognition sites. Um, and, and sort of the, the kind of picture that I, that I like to keep in mind is that, is that basically all the action in a given cell type is driven by somewhere between two and five uh, million touch points on the genome for where factors are sticking in the regulatory DNA. Um, and, and, that, and then if you go and then you look in a cell type and you mine all the sequences that are bound by, uh, by factors, you come up with a, a picture where there's a lexicon of around two to 300 different words that are being utilized out of a, out of a much larger uh, vocabulary. And, and I think it's the case now, uh, very confidently so, that we, meaning the community, is really closing in on uh, a complete recognition lexicon for human transcription factors. Tremendous amount of progress made with, uh, with sort of the classical factors that have been around for a long time. The zinc finger factor um, uh, situation now has the log jam there. It looks like it has been broken. Uh, and, and also the situation with factor dimers and other things. So be, there's a number of uh, uh, important publications that are gonna be coming out on this, uh, from, from, not from our group, but uh, uh, from groups uh, like Tim Hughes and UC Poly and others uh, in, between now and the end of the year. Um, that, uh, that are really going to show, I think, the, the tremendous advances that have been made in, in developing and expanding this, this vocabulary that's, uh, that's out there. But, um, you know, stepping back, though, we are faced with kind of three uh, broader outstanding questions and, and, and kind of approaching and looking forward. For question number one is the question of this delineation question of sort of marking up the genome. Where's all the regulatory DNA? And, and also the sort of second question of within the regulatory region, where exactly is the function encoding? Because right now we're sitting there, we can find regions, we can mark them up and say, oh, there's a bunch of sites in there that factors are recognizing, but how do we know which one's the important one? How do we know this could be redundant, et cetera? Um, and I would say that the technology and the, the sort of the methods to answer this question or these questions to greater than 95% completeness uh, in five years at the level of regulatory regions are at the moment largely in hand. Um, that doesn't mean that they will be necessarily uh, pushed to their limits to be able to do this. Uh, but I think at least at the moment we have the technologies um, uh, in hand. And, and as far as the, I think that, you know, the mapping of where elements are, we have the basic uh, technologies and the real challenge now is, is being able to gain complete comprehensiveness and all the sort of cellular compartments for the function encoding, this is going to require uh, a perturbation, you know, approaches, um, and and this is something that uh, uh, so, for example, you know, recently we had just described an approach where you can use now another technological stream, that of uh, of, of genome editing, to come in and to uh, uh, take advantage of some aspects of the way DNA repair works to sort of selectively or, or rather systematically mutagenize in vivo in situ. A regulatory region that's coupled with a uh, with a downstream output, um, and um, uh, and really introduce essentially perturbations of every single base, and then find 
where you can actually now we will move from the situation where we know there are five transcription factors so that we know that oh 80 percent of the function is in this factor 10 percent in this one and then these are these other ones contribute two or three percent and you get these sort of remarkable effects that that you can actually once you know what each base is contributing you can you can actually uh, uh line them up and generate almost motif like uh features that kind of match with uh with the recognition sequence of um, uh, so it's really something you can take all the way down to not just functional, uh, you know, spots where a factor is binding, but even to which nucleotides uh, are the most important in gating the function. Um, and so, so that that you know that approach at least is in uh, uh, is in hand. And oops, my slide is goofing up. Uh, and so then then the second question that's a delineation. The second question of the connection we talked about. So which element talks to which gene? I said we can sort of make this tentative association with twenty percent of the elements to a target gene. And, and here, the technologies and approaches for validating these predictions, because they're basically predictions, uh, and also for completing this map are really only now being developed. And so this is something that one would expect to unfold with a succession of technologies over the next uh, a couple of years. Um, and, oops, and, and I can give you sort of uh, an, an illustration of where um, I think this is going. So obviously, this kind of problem of connecting up all these elements to all these genes is a huge one. We need an, an approach that's uh, that's kind of high throughput. Um, but I can I can show you uh, first of all that a this approach of actually watching the blinking on and off in coordinate uh, fashion actually does work and seems to be give you a reasonably accurate map. And b uh, give an insight into where uh, the kinds of technologies might might have to go for this. Um, so if we look at a locus, I've just like fished out a locus for GATA1, which is a major erythroid transcription factor, and this is in a particular cell type, uh, erythroid cells, and this is on, um, uh, on, on, chromos on the uh, X chromosomes, a couple hundred, 400 KB region here. So if I went and I followed this and watched the blinking on and off of sites, I would find that there are a uh, relatively small number here of co-regulated hypersensitive sites. And now I could go in here and use uh, a, a technology like with nucleases, with, uh, well, with uh, um, uh, tail effector nucleases, uh, the tail ends, and I can knock these guys out individually. And then I can look at the effect. But the issue is, yeah, you can do this and you can make sequencing libraries and whatever, but you are gonna burn all of your money uh, because <laughs> there are just way too many elements and, and too little money uh, for this. So, um, you know, in my lab, we have actually flipped over now to, or flipping over to using uh, a very inexpensive approach for, um, that's fast also, for looking at the effects of these kind of mutations, which is to use uh, uh, high throughput RNA fish. Um, and then we basically, you know, you can develop a pipeline that, that uh, uh, you can have a, you know, a fluorescent probe to the gene product. Uh, the transcript product, you can then, you know, automatically uh, identify cells. And so we're, so we have a kind of a low light conditions here, but if you were, you were there and here, you could see little tiny spots, you're measuring individual RNA molecules uh, that are coming out. And then you could say, all right, well, what is the effect on, uh, of each of these mutations, you know, counting on literally on the number of transcripts per cell. And, and you can see that you know each of these produces an effect. And actually, I have this here in case of low light conditions. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, you know so here's like the individual RNA molecules, and each of these mutations then uh, you know converges quite rapidly to a a, a very specific defect that's out there, uh, very reproducible. And these experiments can be conducted for a tiny, tiny fraction of the cost, and also a tiny fraction of the time. That, that the normal sort of RNA kind of measurements uh, are done. And one other thing that this illustrates though, is that this does not all add up to one, right? So, so it indicates that there is the expectation here. And we, again, we knew this from the sort of 1980s, 90s, the expectation is that there's interaction between these elements, that you're gonna get non-additive uh, uh, kind of results. Okay, so the, so the final of these uh, outstanding questions is the question of uh, categorization which is what do all these elements out there do? And, and this really, I would say, is the massive problem right now. And quite honestly, we have no real pathway forward on this uh, or no, no coherent strategy. Um, and I think it's actually useful to sort of think about the, cat category, the timeline of functional categorization in the genome. So, you know, we were back in, in the 1980s again, and there were these basic operational definitions that came out of just experiments. People 
what we're doing, enhancer. Oh, it enhances the transcription, promote or promotes, whatever. You know, so we have these like sort of basic uh, uh, functions that are ascribed. And in the 1990s, we had sort of an expanded set of operational de definitions, you know, we're sort of insulator, locus control region, again, that they're very kind of experimentally oriented that were added. Um, and, you know, now we have, of course, uh, as I mentioned, we have the human genome sequence. We had, you know, around 2001, there were 300 elements that were defined, and we had these kind of five main functional categories. Um, and, and so now we're up here, you know, in 2015, we have, uh, you know, 4 million elements, and unfortunately, we still have five functional categories. And this is why everybody calls everything out there an enhancer, because they have no other word for it. You know, it's just like you learn only five words in kindergarten, and, you know, everything looks like, you know, you call everything a dog or something. Uh, but the, uh, uh, but, and, but the, the, the issue, though, is that where, right, so the number one challenge is to kind of come up with an idea of how many animals are there in the woods, you know, and, and let's not worry about what they're all doing at the moment. Can we get some kind of estimates of, of who's out there? And, and again, at the moment, we still don't quite have an approach even for getting that estimate. But where, where is the answer going to come? The answer is going to come from integration. It's going to come from integration across different data types. And this is what the tremendous value of, uh, of you know, an effort that was pioneered by ENCODE and now is adopted by everybody of doing different kinds of assays on the same cell type, even if it doesn't necessarily make sense sometimes up front, you never know when that information is going to be useful and that you can go back and put it together in unexpected ways. So, you know, for example, we, we had uh, uh, described a couple of years ago that there's a set of elements out there in the genome they're parked next to exons. There's like 10 or 20,000 of them. They have a very consistent type of behavior. And what these things do is that they loop that exon over to the promoter where they influence its alternative splicing. Okay? And the only way we stumbled into these things, and once you, again, once you know what to look for, you see, you see that animal all over the place. Um, and, and this was put together by integrating chip-seq data, DNA-seq data, RNA-seq data, and also chrominant chia pet and other chrominant interaction data. There's no way. So, you know, I don't know what this element is called, but again, it's, it's a very distinct thing. We can define it, but it only emerged from this kind of integrative uh, uh, type of analysis. Um, and, and I think I touched on this other question earlier of how densely is information encoded in, in the genome? And what is, again, what is your prior expectation? And so, you know, I think the, 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 the gist of the answer is very, very densely. And, and so we know within, for example, within regulatory systems, we know that there, we have known for a long time that there's overlapping encoding of functions. That can have a factor bind here, and then the next guy can actually recognize like this. Well, then, you know, a lot of people sort of kept things in their head as it, it, separate of the genome, which is like, okay, there's the protein coding stuff, and then there's regulatory stuff, and then there's like junk and whatever. And, but, you know, what, what we sort of found and reported a couple of years ago is that, is that, you know, if you kind of uh, keep an open mind about it, what you notice is that there's, that there's a bunch of what looks like the regulatory stuff that's actually overlapping uh, the protein coding stuff. And this happens when you start, you know, footprinting down and you can see spots in the genome that are bound by a transcription factor and, and that thing is recognizing a particular DNA sequence that also is being used uh, to, to encode for uh, a protein. And this is, this is something that you see uh, all over the place. And, and once you recognize that this is going on, um, you find, for example, that, you know, that all the evolutionary constraints on certain codon positions is concentrated uh, in, 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 these, uh, in, in these spots where the transcription factors are binding, and also that the regulatory and genetic codes have interacted with each other and have actually impacted recent human fitness because the age of the alleles that are sitting inside these spots in, in, uh, uh, are, are uniformly younger. Um, and, and ultimately what you end up with is this picture where uh, you do have these kind of two overwritten codes, but you know, the, we call it, we look at the genetic code, we talk to the genetic code, but the genetic code is really a set of plasma codes. That's where the code is read. It's not read in the nucleus. And the nucleus is another code. And, and that's what the nuclear, you know, so, so the, in other words, that there's, there's a biological separation that allows for this kind of overwriting to happen. And so I think that the general expectation is that expect that there's all kinds of overwriting that nature has just utilized things uh, according to its biological compartments. So I want to just uh, uh, take you through quickly a couple of the patterns, the higher level patterns uh, that emerge and just distill some key points from, from those. Um, the first pattern 
again, this is something that emerged from having lots of data, is that uh, the common disease and trait-linked variation is concentrated in regulatory DNA. And so, you know, I, I, I once I've actually uh, had gone to a, uh, uh, to a, a meeting with Trump with a teacher of animal genome, and was immediately completely floored by people showing pedigrees with 22 million individuals, you know, things like that. So you guys have access to a type of genetic information that people on the human side only dream about. Uh, and and um, but I can tell you just you know briefly the, the human story. I mean, you guys know all about uh, sort of <laughs> disease trait mapping, etc. Uh, but the gist of the you know the gist of this is sort of a big data cross big data uh, uh, you know story. You take GWAS, you the data from all the genome wide association studies in human you know hundreds of different traits, uh, and 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 uh, you cross it by the en encode data. And if you look at the uh, at the data which are reproducible, in other words, that have been externally replicated, so like the highest quality GWAS data, the, the basic picture that you get um, is, uh, is that around 70% of the variants globally across all traits, et cetera, uh, are landing in regulatory DNA, um, another sort of 14% that's, that's in perfect linkage disequilibrium. A lot of people kind of focus on this, this global number, but I actually think it's kind of meaningful. And the reason is, it goes back to what I, I, I mean, aside from the existence of the phenomenon, but it goes back to what I said earlier, that the cardinal feature of the regulatory DNA is cell type selectivity. So, you know, this, this does not take into account at all what's going on on an individual cell type basis. And there, you need to, uh, you need to really take a look at the breadth of, um, uh, of data in context of, uh, of, of other kinds of cell types. And, and here's where you start to see the real nature of the effect. Um, and, and so what, what, I've sh what I'm showing here is taking the results of a GWAS. In this case, it's a GWAS on, uh, uh, on red blood cell trait. And so you take this association study data, you've got a couple million SNPs, every SNP has a p-value, right? And they go all the way from, from the garbage up to the most highly significant SNPs that have just sort of bin things. And then now I'm just walking along in each bin, and I'm gonna take each of about 300 different cell and tissue types, and that's each of these lines here. Uh, and I'm gonna then just ask, what is the, the fold enrichment of the variants uh, in the regulatory DNA of that cell type, okay? And so what you find is you go across, like in this particular case, for the vast majority of cell types, you sort of have nothing. This is kind of the, you know, sort of the, the noisy level. It's a, it creeps up a little bit when you're looking at sort of other blood cell types. But when you look at red blood cells, at erythroid cells, what you find is that all the variants are, are concentrating very specifically and selectively in the regulatory DNA of the erythroid cells. Okay, and, and what the shape of this curve is really important because this, we see this over and over again in every kind of trait, every kind of cell type, and, and this is the, the base of the phenomenon. The phenomenon is that, that we have this line here that, that people drew a long time ago uh, for genome-wide significance, and, and there, was, there was all the rationale in the world for doing it back then. There was, it was really something to sort of filter out where they weren't really sure how to do things, but they, but they were able to get, you know, they knew that all the stuff, at least in this direction, was good, but they didn't know what they were ignoring. But the problem with these kind of, of these lines is like, you know, P equals 0.05, sort of arbitrary in the beginning, but then it starts to stick in people's head that it's like when it's slightly low or something, that it must be garbage. But what you can see is that there is, in this particular case, there's still kind of massive concentration of the, of the variance um, out here. And, and the implication of this is that when you look at a study and somebody says, oh, there were 30 SNPs that were associated with a trait. Well, of course, you know, the number of SNPs here is really high and it goes way down, right? So, so by the time you're way out here, there's a vanishingly small number of SNPs. But the thing is, there's, there's, there in a typical GWAS, there are, for the ones that we've been able to analyze with these kinds of uh, data, there are typically hundreds of variants that are out there that are falling below the significant threshold that I have, but that if you redid everything and was kind of epigenetically, let's call them aware p-values, you would find that they were actually enormously significant. Uh, and it indicates, again, that we're, we're dealing with uh, really kind of a different nature of a process uh, that's out there than, than, than sort of, you know, the one functional variant kind of uh, idea. Um, and also here, is that this in, enmeshes directly with this issue of long-range long gene regulation, with the idea that, um, that genes are talking to each other you know, over long distances. Because what happens then is once you that take the regulatory variants and then ask, all right, what's the causative gene? Because that's what really everybody wants to know, is what are the gene or genes that are involved in, in, in the trait? Well, once you start crossing that in, 
then you find a couple of things. First of all, the regulatory regions that are harboring the SNP associated with uh, a given trait, on average, um, are, are controlling a gene, uh, we, we estimate around 250 kilobases away, okay? And, and, but then once you start dialing these genes in, then all kinds of nice stuff starts showing up. So for example, you know, here's a, a gene, there, here's a variant that is associated with uh, breast cancer, and it's actually landing in a regulatory region that is controlling a two, this gene right here, 411 kilobases away. And it turns out this gene is a gene that we know is a tumor suppressor in, in mammary tissue. Uh, here's another example, say rheumatoid arthritis, that the variant is in a regulatory region controlling 360 kilobases away, a cysteine protease that's already been linked to articular erosions in, the, in rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera. So the, I think, but the key point about all of this is that the, this is information that is distilled from taking the regulums, we'll call them of normal cells, the stuff that you get out of the reference map, and we are crossing it with the genotypes from diseased individuals. We did not need a single diseased tissue in order to draw any of these conclusions. And this is something that is, I, I think a lot of uh, people in the community have not fully put together yet. I mean, um, you know, for example, you know, we, we put, you know, just to tell a, a little story, we put an application in for, um, there was this uh, a psych code project, and we proposed, well, gee, what we're going to do is we're going to go and do sort of fine mapping of all the brain regions, and then we'll have a structure them to bring in all of the, you know, the brain associated and, and psychiatric disease he was. And, and what happened is that it was booted out because it was, it was supposedly not responsive to the RFA, and somebody said, this is brain code, not psych code. And I was like, did somebody not get the message that this, that this is what happens? Because they were saying there was no diseased tissue. It's like, you do not need diseased tissue to make tremendously disease relevant observations out of the normal reference. Um, and, so the, and so everything starts with the normal, all, so all this temptation to go after disease, everything starts with the normal reference. Um, the second pattern to, get, to go through quickly here is this idea that there are higher order kind of meta patterns uh, of, uh, and, and the fact that what we're seeing is that when you look globally across a genome, we're seeing that the pattern of activation of regulatory DNA uh, is, is uh, encoding memories of prior cell states. And this kind of goes back to this idea that, um, uh, that Conrad Waddington had about sort of development and differentiation. Probably every, everybody's seen this little ball rolling down the hill, you know, and then the idea that there's, as cells differentiate, they kind of, you know, are, are supposedly rolling down, and then they have this kind of commitment so that, you know, that they roll in this pathway to become this kind of cell, and they never flip over to become something else. Well, what Waddington sort of sat there and thought about, he's like, you know, there's no way this system could work unless the cell could remember where it's been in some way. Because uh, otherwise, it would always, you know, it'd be like the mouse that you zap its hippocampus. It, you know, every direction in the maze looks great and it never gets out. Um, so, so the idea is that if we look across all these patterns, you know, let's say now I've got this for, you know, 49 or 50 different cell types, and I just throw this into a cluster. And, and what happens is you can recover out of looking at the patterns of ready for you, yes, no, where it exists in normal cell types fully differentiated in an adult, you can actually recover uh, all of the embryological lineage trees. And you can recover events, for example, like the, you know, the fact that the endothelia and all of the blood come off of the same uh, uh, progenitor, et cetera. So all of this information is such to create this tree is somehow carried forward. And, and it turns out that what's going on is that as you follow a cell, let's say differentiated from primitive tissue to progenitors down to, um, uh, down to fully differentiated cells, what you follow, what's going on is that there is systematic persistence of certain elements. So as you, you, know, you start out with this big deck here in, in embryonic stem cells, everything sort of contracts. And by the time you're, you're in hematopoietic progenitors, like 40% of the landscape is persistent from the embryonic, from the, from the stem cells. And, and then there's a bunch of new stuff. And then this happens all over again. So you go down to like this pathway here, this contracts further, this contracts, and then there's a bunch of new stuff. And so it turns out, that roughly uh, half, so all of this stuff right here is the regulatory regions around the genes that if you or I said, okay, show me all the genes you think of when you think B cell, it's, it's this, this is the stuff that's controlling. So what, what, it, what it, and you can do this in any lineage, you can do any of these calculations. And so we currently estimate then that about half of the elements that you see showing up 
in a fully differentiated cell were actually not important for that cell state. They're actually important for a prior cell state. And, and we have a systematic way of figuring out what they are, because we can compare to the progenitors and figure those out. But the ultimate the implication is they're, they're, they're kind of some kind of marker. We don't know how the cell's using them, but you know, if we go and knock them out, we're not gonna expect a whole lot of action from that, from that persistent site. Um, and I'll just skip over this for a second. Okay, and, uh, and, and there's another sort of example of an unexpected pattern that you, again, dialing in other mutations. You know, we looked at the, uh, um, by taking data from another big project from the uh, Cancer Genome Atlas, lots of data on somatic mutation in cancer. You take that data and you cross it with ENCODE data and you get this remarkable uh, phenomenon, which is I look at the, uh, for example, the density of mutations in, uh, in, in a melanoma, where the C to T mutations are, and I look at the chrominant accessibility in, uh, in, in melanocytes. And here I'm going to use a reverse scale where up means actually lower accessibility, lower is better. And, and you plot this, say, across an entire chromosome. And so the, 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 the blue is the, is, the, is the DNA accessibility. So this is worse accessibility. And, and, and the black is the mutations. You can see they're basically tracking each other. Uh, and, and it's really, um, uh, it, it's really remarkable um, how that, uh, and this is now is true in every cancer we've looked at, et cetera. So this, of course, you know, it means that, that, again, these reference maps have unexpected utilities that can be layered into all kinds of simultaneous, uh, you know, simultaneously going projects uh, that, that one can't predict from the outset. Um, and so, again, the key points here is that the maps expect them to be loaded with hidden information. And this is, the, I think, a real uh, uh, important point is that one should expect to dig deep, not to analyze and then move on. The temptation is, I just built out a bunch of data, I publish a paper, and then we stop and we're on to the next thing. And I think a lot of, of uh, folks on in the, in the computational side, that they're always looking for the new data, always looking for the new data. I mean, it, I think there are probably hundreds and hundreds of papers that are waiting to be written on data from the last phase of, you know, of ENCODE that concluded, concluded in 2012. I, it just because there's such an extraordinary amount of deep information there. So in the last uh, minute here, uh, or a couple of minutes, I just want to talk about uh, uh, origins and just give you a way of thinking about things um, re with respect to the human genome. And so one thing I kind of think about is that there's layers of information here. We have like a DNA sequence. We have kind of this nuclear layer, this you know, regulation. There's a cellular layer up there, metabolism, biosynthesis. And then finally, it feeds up to this organismal layer, which is your anatomy, physiology, disease, et cetera. So uh, there was a, as many of you know, there, is a, there was a, a companion project that was initiated later to the ENCODE project, which is mouse ENCODE. Um, and, and mouse ENCODE, and these findings were published uh, uh, the, early, earlier this year, actually, end of, end, end of last year. Um, and, and, and in this, in, in our case, we had gone and, and done uh, mapping across uh, a wide range of mouse cell and tissue types, and you get a whole bunch of, of DNA hypersensitive sites, again, roughly the same averages in a mouse cell. And, and what you can then do, of course, is you can actually compare all this stuff now to the, uh, to, to the human. Um, and, and the key conclusions that sort of came away from this kind of comparison is that the regulatory DNA landscapes have really undergone a, a fairly massive rewiring during the mouse human interval. Um, so the mouse has tons of stuff that's only in the mouse and the human has tons of stuff that's only in the human. Uh, but they do share, the human and mice do share a core kind of regulon that tends to be concentrated, regulatory regions that are concentrated in cell, particular cell and lineage identity programs. Uh, and that, that the evolution of the landscape involves several different things. Firstly, extensive repurposing of elements to different tissues. So an element that was, you know, seems to be working in the liver and the mouse shows up in the brain in human or vice versa. Uh, you have also continuous re-evolution of function on the same piece of regulatory DNA. And there's actually a biophysical reason for that. It turns out to be a very fertile ground. And so that you can really turn over all the transcription factors in the same spot in the genome. Um, and, but there's also this another meta feature going on where evolution's really raising its hand. Uh, and that is that there is, appears to be, in spite of all this turnover, there's strict conservation of a particular parameter, which is the proportion of the regulatory genome that a given transcription factor sees in a cell 
is essentially constant between human and mouse across all transcription factors and all cell types that we've been able to look at. And what I mean by that is that if you go and I'm a transcription factor and I recognize some word and I go and I measure how much, literally how many bases of the regulatory DNA in, in one cell type in human do I occupy, say a few percent, and then I go to the same cell type in mouse, let's say regulatory T cells in, in human, regulatory T cells in mouse, and I go and I measure that number, and then I, I get a number for each of those. I do that for all transcription factors. That's what each of these dots are. They all fall on a line. So that that, that meta feature is what evolution is, uh, is, is preserving. And the other thing that evolution is preserving is another higher level feature, which is the networks. And this shook out of an analysis where we took the mouse data, about half of it, we drove it very deep down to the level of footprints. We computed uh, uh, regulatory networks skip by this, and what you emerge with is this final picture, is that the farther you get away from the genome sequence, the more the mouse and the human start to look the same. So if you look at like the level of DNA bases, what do people say? You know, a few percent of the human genome is, uh, is quote unquote conserved. If you look at the level of where transcription factors are sticking on the genome, it's around 22%. If you look at the, where at transcription factors, that, can, that connect to other transcription factor genes, about 44% of those connections are preserved through the evolution of new features. And by the time you get out to regulatory networks and, act, and ask how they are architected, the human and the mouse basically look the same. Uh, they're essentially uh, superimposed. And so I'll leave you with just a, a quick thought about the next five years. And, and here, what I think is gonna transpire is that and this is the human trajectory, but it's, it's, it's uh, it, I think there are lessons for, for what you all are doing as well, is here we are gonna make a transition to, from discovery to detection. In other words, finding all the new elements is one thing. And, and then even if we knew at this point in time, if I snap my fingers, we had a complete map of where all the elements were, we still have this enormous challenge of understanding how they're activated combinatorially because that's where all the biology is coming to play. And so uh, just kind of sketching some stuff on a, on a timeline here, I would, uh, you know, there's gonna be, I think, a, a major push to try to complete sort of anatomical and condition specific exposure maps so that over the next, you know, you can plus or minus a few years, whatever, over the next two, three years, that, that there's gonna be an enormous amount of this data coming, coming together such that I think that if things go, uh, 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 in, in, in one you know, possible trajectory, we could be sitting in a situation within you know, a couple of years uh, by 2018, where we could, by many different measures, say that we're probably 90% of the way there, or perhaps even 95% of the way there, in terms of getting the map of where stuff is uh, in, in, in the human genome. And, and by that time, again, assuming that certain technologies advance their way forward and can be applied in high throughput, I think it's also reasonable in this time frame that we might be able to connect about half of the regulatory DNA with the target gene uh, uh, if, if the throughput and everything keeps, keeps going the way that it has. Uh, but of course, layered into all this is that there's this ongoing project of trying to understand this functional categorization. What does every element do? And again, we still don't have a handle on where that's ultimately going to go. But when you then think about, okay, if we know where the regions are, there's still, even with today's information, you open a separate branch and say, what if I could just really cheaply detect where these things are, you know, in, in a sample? Could have enormous uses, uh, in, in enormous utility. So for example, if I could, you know, light up uh, 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 and detect with microscopy individual elements in cells, uh, I could do all kinds of stuff. I could do rapid and expensive detection of clinical samples. Uh, and then finally, you know, uh, incorporate that into diagnostics and other things. And really, this is sort of, I think, the trajectory that, that we're going to ultimately walk over the next, next five years. Um, and so with that, I just want to close and, and from my own lab, acknowledge some just wonderful uh, students and fellows and, and uh, UWM Genome, our collaborators, and of course, uh, are the funding agencies that made uh, all of this and many other things possible, uh, NHGRI and the NIH Common Fund. Thanks. <coughs> Wow. Uh, thanks very much for a wonderful walk through uh, an enormous amount of data and, and uh, resources and, and conclusions. Um, just a couple of uh, items on how to ask questions. 
we've got microphones. If you could go to the microphone, um, we're gonna, we've got at least one handheld we can run around as well. Um, but there are people online that are listening. And so please go to a mic so that they'll be able to hear you as well. Um, for the people online, I would say um, we, you can ask questions and we're trying to make sure that that's done in an efficient way. So um, there's two chances or two ways you can do that online. Uh, one is to type your question and we can read that question out or you can actually raise your hand electronically and we'll try to recognize that. So just uh, given that, um, I'll open the, the floor for questions um, if there are any. Jamie's got a question. Yes, thank you, Be beautiful. Um, so my question, you spoke about the diversity of regulatory elements across cell types, and then the end spoke of origins. As we fill in more than two points between mouse and human, and we look at the functional annotation of animal genomes, what uh, resolution do you anticipate in these complex questions as we look at multiple animal species, cell type, regulatory elements overlaid on phylogenetic relationships? My expectation is that if you could do an ENCODE-like project for one to two other species, uh, you would largely uh, solve the comparative genomic picture. And this, this may sound like a kind of audacious claim, but it's actually based on a bunch of calculations that we had done based on a figure in um, a science paper. So it, it, for the mouse, so our, our paper that was part of the mouse and toad suite of papers, there's, there's a figure um, which basically takes all of the human and mouse regulatory DNA and then goes across every extant genome, mammalian genome, and actually every extant vertebrate genome and aligns it all. And what you can then see from that picture is that if you were able to sort of functionally instantiate just even one other organism, you would be able to uh, really solve a lot of the sort of, get, uh, of the question marks as to which, what element is actually being conserved or not. But to be able to instantiate more than one of those elements, the results are going to start to come very immediately. Uh, and, but, uh, but I guess the question is, what's going to be the, the implication? The implication, I think there's, there's two aspects of it. One is the, um, is the stuff that is unique to the organism. That turns out to be super important uh, because what that allows you to look at is, so for example, disease associated variants, things like that in the human actually concentrate in the regulatory DNA that is unique to human versus the stuff that is uh, shared with the mouse. Um, and, but the flip side of it is that it also allows you to go organ system by organ system and ask, is this, or how similar is this organ system and its regulatory apparatus to the human? And what that allows you to do is to focus in on which of the systems that, that we, that I, we think, that, this is sort of speaking model, but let's say for the mouse, we've done this exercise now with, with several groups, is, is trying to, you know, saying, okay, for a particular process, the mouse would be expected to be you know, a good model uh, system for this. But for other ones, there's like high divergence. And so that you're expecting that the biology is going to, you know, to diverge tremendously. And so I think it really depends on, you know, on what you're going to do with that information. But I, I would approach it at saying that every organism can have its own day in the sense that just expect that everything's going to have a lot of stuff that's unique to it, that that's going to be enriched for, you know, traits and diseases, et cetera, that, that are unique to that, that organism. So John, if you're thinking about traits, then one aspect that hasn't really been talked about yet is the penetrance of traits. And frequently, the penetrance of, of human traits manifest in old age. So I'm wondering whether or not you've given some thought to how you might um, correlate these regulatory regions with, this, with these changing penetrance as you age. Yeah, so I think that this, the, the question you raise about aging, is is a uh, either way yeah, is 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 a question that it's um, it touches on a more generic topic and it touches on what is it really the uncharted territory in the in the delineation of uh, sort of the functional delineation of genomes 
which is condition specific and time specific effects. Thus far, you know, we have been looking at just trying to get a handle on where things are, but you know, we don't, so we know, for example, there's a really big difference between cell type A and cell type B. What we do not know is if I take cell type A and I expose it to 50 different things, that, you know, what are all the possible avenues that that cell type can, can take? And, and there we start to see different kinds of things. We not to see the difference between cell type A and cell type B is largely black and white. This one has these elements that this one does not and vice versa. In the condition specific space, and this is true, any kind of condition, differentiation, aging, whatever, then you start to have the stuff that is the black and white, and then also the variation and the consistent variation in amplitude, okay? And so I think actually that this is, I, I kind of had it up on, on, on one of the slides very briefly, but I think this is something now that, so to really address the condition specific space efficiently means you, you have to have assays that are very cheap and very fast. This is not something you, that could have been done systematically with the technologies, let's say, uh, of even one or two years ago in terms of you know, what it costs to generate a map of anything, really. So you need, you need technologies that can be applied on the scale of $100 an experiment, $200 an experiment, not, not several thousand dollars an experiment to really, because those spaces are so huge, because then you start crossing conditions to age and, and whatever. So I think that that's, uh, um, I think knowing that will provide insights into, into the question you're asking. And there is some clear evidence though, that, this, that, that there is gonna be tremendous value in the, in the particularly in the age question. Here's, here's this actually, I wanna step back. There's actually a different aspect of this. So in, in, in aging, you're talking about looking at young animals versus old animals, and also looking at developing animals versus mature animals, et cetera. So I can tell you, for example, that the um, that we had done this analysis with the UOC data, uh, in which we, we had sort of the first round of uh, human fetal data uh, at the time that this was done. So we could compare fetal and adult cells with how the traits map on the regulatory DNA. And what you were able to do actually is to find certain traits that were selectively concentrating in the regulatory DNA of the fetal. Uh, uh, tissues versus the regulatory DNA of the adult tissue. And, and there's some, and, and the fetal stuff is things like we, we know at the far end of the spectrum where the known gestational exposure, you know, like the age of anarchy, the NL, the Barker traits, and things like that. And at the opposite end, the stuff that was concentrating in the regulatory DNA you saw in adult cells were things where aging was for bone mineral density, Alzheimer's, cancer, that kind of stuff. And, and you know, more recently, we've had some interesting finds come up. So, you know, those, that plot I showed you of the uh, uh, of BLOC blood cell rate mapping on blood cell. Well, if you go and you take all the brain data that was listed, and which was part of the fetal brain, and then you map in all of the GWAS, which is things like Alzheimer's, et cetera, we never saw it. And we were like, we couldn't tell if the studies were bad or whatever. And then as you start getting adult brain data, suddenly you get this huge leap up. In, in the segment. Suddenly now, now it looks like everything else. So it really shows that there is time specific, that it, it is, that that's a, a, a vital element to, to, to dial in uh, to, to any kind of strategic picture. Go ahead, Lars. So for this effort, like how much of this, like the, what the, this group is trying to do would help the biomedical community or you know, what do you see as, uh, as a, see as a role for, like we have several agencies here also looking into this and, and, and seeing, because, you know, you have this huge investments made in the human and mouse. And one of the things that, you know, some of the agencies here are looking into is like whether the, those information can be used for the benefit of agriculture and also somehow the, you know the uh, what what the group is trying to do will help the biomedical science. You can throw some light. Oh, I I think that there will again with the right organisms will have uh, it will have enormous impact and in, in the following in particularly uh, in in the kind of discovery and application uh, of medicines and uh, because you know here you have a situation where where I was saying that that you really want to understand what's the right model. And this kind of information now suddenly, you know, we were looking at, at, at sort of model systems 
pick, pick, pick any organ from out there. Look, in genetics, you, we may use a few models. But you go to, let's say, pharmaceutical industry, they have all kinds of different models. They've got rats, they've got dog, they've got pig, they've got whatever. There's, there's a whole bunch of, and they're using it in different ways. And they cannot, nobody understands. Like anybody doing toxicology, anybody doing whatever, anybody doing it, you know, environmental exposures or whatever. People don't have a good understanding of how that trait mapped in that organism goes over to humans. But with this type of, you know, of, of analysis, we can say, ooh, the, you know, cow is going to be a great model for this particular thing. And so, or, you know, the, or the pig or, or whatever. And so I think there, there, there can be immediate benefits that will be reaped. Because again, just because it's not the best model or organism for laboratory, you know, genetics doesn't mean it's not an incredibly useful organism uh, for other kinds of, uh, you know, actually the, the kind of the biomedicine where the rubber really hits the road in terms of actually modeling, you know, human uh, disease and, and physiological processes. So I think that's where the, where we're seeing a lot of action. Go ahead, Tim. So, so lately with the availability of resequencing for a lot of livestock species and, they, and a lot of that's done as Chris pointed out in his opening remarks, um, the, the trend or, or the fashion right now is to, now we have identified a lot of SMPs that look like they might affect the protein sequence or something like that. And so now there's a lot of focus on that. And I just wonder what your perspective from a, a regulatory um, when you're in earlier in your remarks might be. Well, uh, in the human anyway, 95% of the variants that are associated with any given disease or trait are not in the protein coding sequence. So just sheer numbers wise, it's a small minority. Um, and there's also this perception out there that somehow we can make more sense of the protein coding variants than we can non-coding variants. And, and actually I would challenge this, this assumption because if you go and you take uh, any given, so how do we assess the function of protein coding variants? Whether well, they're biochemical assays, and then there are also these various structure prediction programs and you know this kind of substitution is more radical than other ones. And, and there are all these packages out there, and these packages, you know, like polyphen 2, et cetera. And they have been subjected to testing in cases where, where we know, where we have methods of really understanding about chemical function, either through some assay, and, and it turns out that, that their predictive accuracy ends up, you know, doing sort of a receiver operating uh, uh, analysis, ends up with an AUC of around 0.6 for the best package, okay? If you simultaneously go with the best algorithms currently available for predicting if a particular variant in regulatory DNA is functional, meaning it interrupts the right binding of a protein, the AUC for that now is, is approaching 0.8 with, with new algorithms that are, that are, are uh, just being published, uh, you know, uh, that, that have come out that are, that are 0.7 range, other ones are, are coming out. So actually, we have we are sitting in a situation where, where understanding whether something is you know doing something or not is not really much different for protein coding than regulatory uh, regions. Maybe could I follow up on that because um, it relates to a question I had. Um, how you mentioned a lot of the data came from sort of using or starting with about a hundred different cell types. Um, is there, a, is there a minimum that the community started with that allowed them to, to make a significant amount of progress? Or was it just after the fact that you had over 100 cell types, then that's, that's when you started doing the data? I guess I'm trying to get a feel for our group. Do we need 10 cell types? Do we need 50 cell types? Um, you know, how, much, how much of it is, is tissues that we can use versus cell types? I mean, that's kind of one of our, one of our questions is that at what how many do we need? At, at what point can we stop and, and say it's going to be productive to analyze? Uh, well, I would say that the analysis productivity can be can happen very quickly because I mean, the, it, but it depends on the kind of questions you want to ask. I would say that the that the, um, the, the uh, you know that the projects that you guys are contemplating are much more similar to let's say the mouse and code project and the way that that came together. So that was built on a lot of experience for, for the human. It was largely a tissue based anatomically. Uh, uh, organized project yeah, yeah. with coordinated data generation uh, on, on the, so there was actually a combination of cell lines that were you know, used where, where you needed lots of material or something, and also primary primary tissue, but uh, but, but but largely uh, you know, tissue data. Uh, and I think that the uh, and you know there when we were able to extract the you know, ten or twenty. Uh, 
didn't need a huge number. I think that, in other words, we would, what one would, like, what would prioritize, I think, probably, is to get, you know, the eight or ten mo big sort of kind of issues. And then after that, it's maybe some, you know, sub-compartments or maybe different kinds of adipose. I don't, it depends on what you're asking. Then, sure, then it becomes sure. more strategically directed. But I think that the idea is that you, you can get the results quite quickly and you don't, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if the situation is the same with animal genomes as it was with human, where there are a very large number of primary cells and cultures that you can order from companies and things like that. So that probably doesn't exist. So, so doing the individual cell types, lots of them, is going to be vastly more difficult. Um, I think with the tissues, that the key thing is ensuring that, uh, that you have common sources prepared in common ways that, that, and, and that they are, that people are working on the same material. That just because you have a genetically identified, you know, identical individual in you know, different places, it's all operators. <laughs> you, know, you know, unless it's like a super well understood process, like, you know, people know how to stage embryos, I get the embryo and get plant thing, that's fine. But, the, uh, but for other stuff, I think that the, um, you know, what's worked out very well is having one source. And then getting getting the material in a form which helps you very key as well. It is stable and distributed. So I think you know now key assays, DNAs, chip, et cetera, can all be done on frozen tissues with good results. Uh, and um, you know uh, uh, again, I think all the lessons that have been learned in encode, GTEx, roadmap, et cetera, can be can be applied here. The roadmap had very extensive dis distribution actually of frozen tissues, uh, of fetal tissues, uh, as well as some adult. Tissues and code has also, uh, 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 you know, I think really now uh, pioneered the sort of systematic collection of tissues from a rapid autopsy uh, with just, I mean, in our case, we've got remarkably good uh, results, you know, from that, just frozen tissues and, and whatever. So I think the models are there that if people, so in code, for example, use the infrastructure that was put in place by the GTEC project for getting individuals consenting and, and, and doing the op rapid autopsies, breathing in a standard way. And distributing and if that is set up properly and it gets a run in and everybody agrees that hey we're doing the same stuff and that's you know then then it's got the limit right so. um i think we'll just take one more question um okay i think you've very usefully uh argued the case that if you if you want to understand the pig you need a pig regulum um and the, the, the benefit to the biomedical world of, of having a pig regulum, if you're making the case that a pig kidney is going to be useful for, for human medicine, I think that's really useful. Um, I think the thing that struck me most was when you did the cell type specific uh, enrichment for the SNPs and the GYs, because so I, I guess for that, for the example you showed, it was pretty obvious that if you look at um, the rest of our lineages for um, uh, blood um, um, traits, then that works out that way. Um, if you're if you're dealing with a trait where you're not really sure where the primary effect is, would this approach work where you look at where you just in essence scan through all the cell types and look where you see the, the screamingly significant enrichment and that says, okay, that that's the, the source of the problem and that's where you might target your drug? That that is uh, in principle, yes. And and in fact uh, that that's something that that has been applied that way. So you can so for example, even if in, in cases where you did not know, let's let's just even take that arithmetic example. Let's say you did not know, and you just went through one by one every cell type. That result would have popped out. You know, uh, uh, different uh, CH17 T cells will pop out of you know Crohn's disease across all cell types, right? and, and on and on. And sometimes you get these wacky things that we just look at. We're like, why is the signal concentrating? In, you know, in this in this tissue versus other. Uh, other tissues, and and I think that it, you know, so it, it does. It is a way to steer you in an undirect, you know, or hypothesis free way towards particular uh, biological pathways. Very good. Uh, I think, in the interest of time, we'll close it here. Let's thank Dr. Stan one more time. Uh, and you're now welcome to join uh, uh, us for. Um, some refreshments. We have light bites um, just down the stairs and across into the courtyard, which is West Court, right across the way. So, uh, it, uh, we will start up uh, bright and early at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So we'll see you at eight.
Oh yeah, absolutely. I was intrigued by this idea 